Okay, let's get started. This is the final lecture we have before the examination on Monday. And I have this slide up to remind myself to speak a little more about that examination. The trial examination has been prepared and is ready for you to take. I'm experimenting with two options on controlling the access to the exam. The option that I've been using since about this time last year in this class at Econ 53 is an option that's high security, but one that can be beat if you're resourceful. But it's also very easy for you to use and also very easy for me to use. The other option is a much higher security option that would be very difficult to beat, but it requires you to log in and it requires me to load up your first name, last name, and email to the site that administers the exam, then you're contacted that this has happened and you change some information and give yourself a password, then you log in at the appropriate time to take your exam. And uh, that's a very high security option given the way you can set that up. I don't want to use it because it's too much trouble. And also, what I have to load in are your first and last names as shown in the records for this class. And some of you don't actually go by those names. Now, you are told what the first and last name the, the exam uses is, and you're allowed to override that. But if you forget to do it or uh, you don't do it and then can't log in during the exam, that creates a problem for both you and me. And then if a whole bunch of you do it, I have to actually go manually override my records, and that's a lot of work. So on the first exam, I'm going to think about it a little more, but on the first exam, I'm going to use the old protocol, which works reasonably well. Uh, but I have metrics on that exam, and if those metrics are exceeded, then I will roll over to the more secure exam the second time around. And I'm not going to tell you what those metrics are, except that I'll give you a set of instructions that you're asked not to violate, and if enough of you violate those instructions, then the metric will be breached. All right, that's the way I'm going to set it up. It's really not too much of a problem. Uh, it is the case, though, that in this class and in Econ 53, I now have to monitor the exams because I had some cheating incidents uh, three years ago and two years ago that caused a lot of problems. I used to give these exams as open book, walk out of the room, take them wherever you want, uh, even go back to the dorm room and take them. And there wasn't much cheating, I can say that. That's a good thing about Harvey Mudd. But there was just enough to where it was a problem. And I have to say, uh, there on, in one of the semesters in Econ 104, it was the year before last, in the single class there were seven cheating incidents, but five of them were from non-mutters. And that's actually more of a problem because the procedures for dealing with cheating from the other colleges is very erratic and inconsistent when it comes to treating cheating that's in a class here. And so for me, it ends up being a real nightmare trying to deal with what to do about the cheating. And then one of those also went to trial from here. There were three from here. It went to trial, a big long trial. Those sort of things take up 20 hours of my time for a single trial. So I said, nope, can't do that anymore. Uh, even if there's only the possibility of one or two people in a class of 200, it just, you know, if I do it and there's a problem that it's going to cost me 10 to 20 hours to deal with it, I don't have that kind of time. So I have to give you the exam, even if you have to take it at a different time where it's being monitored by me. And that will keep the uh, breach down to zero for the largest part. And that's what I'm trying to do. Um, so you will get a notification one way or the other that that exam is available. It already exists. I just have to release it. And you will have until between now and whenever I say in the email that I send, but uh, probably Sunday at some point to take that exam. It's a mix, a selection of questions from all five modules or all five chapters, I should say, kind of a representative mix so you'll have a sense of what the exam is like. It'll be timed according to how I plan to time it more or less, but I gather the statistics on how you perform on the exam 
And then I adjust the timing of the actual exam based upon those statistics. So if a high percentage of you don't finish given the abbreviated time, then I add time on a proportionate basis to the actual exam. If on the other hand, it was clear that you didn't need the last five minutes and I'll take four of those five minutes off the last exam. Um, also, if you have friends in this class that aren't attending because they rely upon the video, which is perfectly fine with me, be, please advise them before they start sending me a barrage of questions about these exams to look at the opening of this video first because I'm getting a lot of emails from students that haven't been coming to class but haven't been watching the uh, videos about things I'm covering in the class and I don't have the luxury of answering the same question 35 times for a subject that I covered in the class. So ask your friends to make sure they look at at least the opening of the videos to make sure that I haven't already covered it here. So this was already said last time and you already know it. And the uh, examination will probably be a 30 minute or a 35 or a 40 minute exam, depending upon whether I figure out how to add a large matching section to the question set. I haven't quite figured out the technology for that yet. I have to actually tweak the software to do it myself. If I get it figured out the next day, then that'll be there and I'll tell you so. If I don't, then it won't be, then I'll tell you that as well. Um, but it shouldn't surprise you. It's, I think, of middle difficulty. Some of the questions are just dead giveaway. If you can breathe, you can answer the question. Some of them are more difficult. Two or three are, you know, you're not going to know it unless you've actually read the material and kind of remembered it. And I'm going to give you, as I promised, a guideline on um, how to study for the examination posted as a video probably on Friday. I'm also going to send out an email to two groups of students. The emails will be sent to all of you, but it'll have information for specifically two groups. The students uh, who have special consideration, once again, I will have figured out exactly how I plan to work with that, as I've told some of you privately. And if you have a class conflict, so you're looking at the video, then you will be requested to take that exam, uh, a different altered exam actually, but of the same difficulty, uh, under my supervision later in the evening in a room here that I'll schedule at Harvey Mudd. So that's how we're going to deal with all of that, all right? And you'll all get emails to that effect as the exam approaches. It's still five days away, so we have time to make sure that everything's working to your satisfaction and to my satisfaction. Now I need to finish the material on mutual funds to make sure that you're comfortable with that, so let me go do that now. Go to the appropriate slide. You know, there we go again. Okay, thanks Bill. I've got my, the new Linux machine, the super compact, tight little machine running in my office really well. It's literally the size of this keyboard right here, a very powerful machine. And I'm gonna post a video on how to build one to encourage you to build one. Um, at some point, I'll show. I'll bring it in class and show it to you after the exam. Okay, we get everything all set up here, and we go to. We stopped on the tax issues, and I had discussed this slide. Again, making the point, which is sometimes hard to figure out, that. For mutual funds are sometimes taxed internally in the churn and so you'll get a tax liability even if you've sold absolutely nothing. If the fund's manager has sold stocks inside the fund and you'll get a 1099 div that will represent that capital gain and normally it is taxed at the capital gains tax rates, the brackets of which are shown here. But if for some reason the fund has owned that asset for less than one year, you'll actually be taxed at the personal income tax rate instead. So, um, and then the tax bracket it depends upon your adjusted income as filed on your 1040. And that also depends upon your marital status as is shown here. Now I'm not gonna ask you to remember numbers like this. I want you to understand the general principle of why mutual funds have a bit of a tax disadvantage if they're not in a retirement account. 
If they're in a retirement account, then obviously none of this applies because the gains made, even if made internally within the fund, are not passed on as taxes to the fund holder because it's an IRA account. Uh, now, mutual, uh, remember I was saying a couple of weeks ago, I was mystified, or t a week ago, I guess it was, I was mystified by the repo problem. No, no, see, no, sorry, different problem. Mystified by that too. I was mystified by the fact that mutual fund contributions and ETF contributions have both turned down a lot, and yet that has not been actually reflected in a downturn in the market. Now, actually, that's no longer true. The market has had two very bad days, so if this stays, then we can say, yep, it was reflected in a downturn on the market. If you've checked your portfolio, you've probably lost a lot of money so far. You're not doing very well. If this continues, and it very well might, then you may end up being the loser class of Econ 104, the class that suffered the most traumatic losses of any class ever taken because you bought all your stuff at the exact peak of the market <laughs> if it turns down and keeps going, but who knows. The economic news generally is quite bad, and uh, or it keeps emerging as surprisingly bad, but I'm not going to talk about that until after you take the exam. We don't have time to talk about it. But I said that I couldn't quite figure out where the source of the strength of this market was, given that mutual funds and ETFs matter so much. But looking at this data, which I've seen since I made those comments, I didn't realize that uh, there was so much out there of institutional investing that is taking place not through mutual funds and ETFs. That was in a book that I found. And the, um, the red represents other investors uh, investing in the stock market that are not mutual funds and ETFs, and it's a larger number than I would have thought. And so it means that really large-scale investors are, in fact, making sizable investments, whether growing them or shrinking them, in assets that are not mutual funds and ETPs. And so their activity can, to some extent, explain a divergence of the stock market away from the data for exclusively mutual funds and ETPs. So uh, maybe that's why there has been a bit of a disconnect. This group, at least not until the beginning of the new quarter, and this is partly the reason why the market has been declining, we started off a new quarter, and that kind of behavior is sometimes common. This group was not following retail out of the market quite so aggressively as uh, I would have thought, and they have a bigger share of the market. Maybe that's why the market has held up its strength, despite weakness in the fund flows into mutual funds and ETFs. Now, to return to the discussion of uh, the mutual funds, I've already pointed out to you on a number of occasions that it's very wise for you to invest in index funds in your retirement portfolio especially for a number of reasons. And when people ask me what kind of investment can I make that's a passive investment where I don't need to spend a lot of time figuring out what the stock market's going to do, I say, well, just choose either a single index fund and one or two bond funds and just vary the proportions in those two fund classes as I describe in this lecture over your lifetime or else when you're young, put 70% in the index fund and 30% in the bond fund and rebalance to those proportions every few years if one grows at the expense of the other. And aside from that, don't do anything. And so the argument is, well, what if I have two or three million dollars? You're saying I can invest the entire portfolio that's liquid into two assets. One of them, the Vanguard S&P 500 mutual fund and the other, the United States Treasury mixed bond fund. And I'm saying, that's exactly what I'm saying. You can do that. And in fact, this strategy is so popular, it explains why the S&P 500 Vanguard Fund has been capped because so many people are using this kind of strategy that the fund is simply too large to allow it to grow anymore. But there are, are other S&P 500 funds or some very close to it that you can use instead of specifically that index fund. But the other reason for investing in the index fund especially the S&P 500 index fund, is because over time, managed funds don't really seem to beat it consistently. 
in any given year, there'll be a number of funds that do beat it. Maybe 10% of all funds listed will beat it, but those same funds don't appear up the next year is beating it. So in other words, they'll soar ahead of it the next year, but they'll fall back the year after. And so if you look at a five or 10 year period of time, the S&P 500 fund is right up there at the very top. And even if there's one or two or three or five or 10 above it, a priori, you never would have guessed that those would be the funds that would beat it probably by any sensible criteria. You just would have been lucky to have invested in those funds that had enough sense to actually be able to beat it. Then the third reason is, again, there are no, there's no turnover in these funds, and so you don't have to worry about the hidden fees. And the hidden fees, of course, apply to all funds, including funds that are tax-exempt, because they're not included in the commission charges, they're implicit in a depreciated price for the fund itself because of what they are. They consist of the spread between bid and ask and the loss associated with that reality and the fact that you're effectively transferring that tiny difference to algo traders. And to me, it's worth it that you do because they keep the, the uh, spread narrower by virtue of earning that transfer, and that's a good thing on net, I think. And then the other is market impact, because if you're one of these big funds and you're trying to buy and sell, you have market impact upon the price of the security in question, and sometimes there can be a terrific cost for that. So none of that is a problem with an index fund, because index funds are net long. They never sell their portfolio or sell very little of it. They have to sell some for various reasons, but we saw that the churn rate, for example, on the S&P 500 index fund was 8% compared to a target date fund I'm going to show you here in a minute that's 141% and the like. So there's a reason why these are popular. And in 2008, when we took a look at total assets, 82% of mutual fund investments were in actively managed mutual funds. And here we are in 2018, 10 years later, for the complete year, where only 64% are in actively managed funds. And index funds have picked up all that growth from 8 to 18%. And as I said, my favorite, where I invest for myself and others, are the two big Vanguard funds, v and, uh, VFI and X and uh, VFIAX. Unfortunately, those are now closed, so you have to find substitutes for them. They're not closed for me, but they're closed for uh, new investors. And as I say down here, the portfolio turnover rate has been 3% annually since 2013. And you can see when you look at the charges, none, 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 all the way down the line. And you can see that the uh, service fee or charges like $20 a year or the uh, management fees are 0.12%. And that's just about as low as is possible for a fund to go. So this is one of the reasons why A index funds are so popular. This is also the primary reason where I advise people, if you know, if you're not going to try to manage it yourself, and maybe even if you are, put your money in index funds and you'll do very well. It, all that remains after that is to figure out the proportions of the portfolio you want. You had a question a moment ago. Yeah. Uh, what makes the companies in the S&P 500 so great? What makes them so great? Yeah. Well, that's like asking what makes Apple so great, right? And so you, as well as anybody else, know the answer to that. They just do a very good job at what they do, or they look, roll out technologies that people want, or they do it and arrange their manufacturing overseas so they have massive markups in the products they sell. They're very good at advertising. They're very well managed. They hire the best people. And so um, that's why Apple is distinguished, perhaps, from General Electric, right? And, um, I mean, it's just basically kind of a common sense. Um, so why don't they all do it? For the same reason you won't all perform the same on the exam. So uh, some of you will get really solid straight A's and others won't do as well, for whatever reason that's true. Yeah, so this is all outside the retirement account, right? This is the all outside what? The focus on avoiding term, high term rates is outside the retirement account. So no, no, uh, no, not at all. Uh, part of this is because of the internal fees. You get uh, the charges and the bid ask spread and all that, you get hit with that no matter where, okay. right? Because if you have a high turnover fund that's in an IRA account, it still pays implicitly those fees. Okay. okay. 
So as I say here, here's the summary. The fund is, of course, di diversified. As goes the market, so goes the S&P 500. It outperforms 85 to 90 percent of all other mutual funds. It has extremely low fees and expense ratios, around one-tenth of one percent or lower. We just saw that for the most recent year it was 0.12. There's no churning. There's no interim tax liability if it's a taxable account. Uh, and then it's available from all reputable low fee fund families and often available in 401k plans. So it basically satisfies all of your needs. I got a note a few years back from Mutter Charles Matlack, uh, who got interested in finance after he graduated. He did a big startup and then got into finance for a while. And it is the case that the S&P 500 index fund is weighted by market cap. And so there has been some research that indicates that a fund that would have an equal weighting would perform better. That is to say, every stock would have one five hundredth of the weight instead of weighted by market cap. And so a mutual fund was created with that weighting. It's the Guggenheim um, S&P 500 Pure Value Fund, I think it's. And so when he sent that to me, the, the little slide that's right there, the red represents the Guggenheim Fund that has the S&P 500 stocks, but equally weighted. And the blue represents the actual index, therefore any fund that conforms to it. And when he sent that to me, clearly the the equally weighted fund was outperforming. So since then, I've sort of kept an eye on it. But since then, at least this year, it was pretty much a tie. They're much closer to each other this year than they were when Charles sent me that graph, as you can see. So it doesn't matter very much. Um, but perhaps it may revert back to the equal weight performing better. And that is a controversial topic. I don't have much of a feel for it. I don't think it really matters very much so long as you invest in one or the other. Now, I'm going to talk specifically about target date retirement funds, and they will be represented on the exam because they're what the industry is pushing right now and because of their marketability, especially for retirement accounts. And I don't think they're very suitable assets for a couple of reasons. I'm fairly critical of them. And it's not just the ones I'm using here by example. I chose this example because it's easy to get data from this fund family, and so um, I've done that. But in general, these funds that change the balance of the fund over time to represent your age with the general strategy of moving from a heavy stock balance to a balance as you grow older that has more bonds represented and proportionally fewer stocks. Always, these funds have that kind of perspective, no matter what the fund family. And so we have two funds to compare here. This uh, PIMCO series has funds for every five years between 2020 and 2055. And so I've chosen one that's near the 2025 to compare to the uh, most distant to 2055. And you can see that the 2055 might be the fund that you would buy because your target would be, say, around 2055 or 2060. So if you look at the breakdown of that fund, they have the same general categories of assets, then the um, representation of the stocks or stock-related investments is in red, and the represented in blue is in um, for bonds. And those consist of, in the case of the red, a combination of large cap stocks, small cap stocks, global stocks, and emerging market stocks. And you can see that they have 30% of their investment in global and emerging market stocks of the total category. So those are very, very heavy in stock market investments and very light on bonds. And the green represents real estate, but in the market form of real estate, so-called real estate investment trucks, trusts, which are commoditized into stocks, investment trusts, and no commodity representation. So that's all real estate investment trucks. But if you were closer to retirement, if you were my age or say 55 or 60, then you're going to be in the 2025 fund instead. And as you can see, in comparison, that fund has almost 50% of its portfolio in bonds and only 50% of the portfolio in stocks. And this generally reflects the philosophy of the way these funds work. It's interesting, though, as the markets change, that 
given any set amount of time you get closer to the retirement, the proportion that they have in stocks, say for the most distant one, actually changes quite a bit. About three years ago, the most distant fund only had about 75% of the portfolio in stocks. And now the same distant fund has, um, and that would have been say the 2045 or the 2050, has a much higher percentage. So they sometimes manage this also to try to catch whatever is hot. And in the past, the bond funds have been better represented on the top fund, but now their yields are so low that to get any kind of yield at all, the fund managers are taking a bit of a risk in having a larger stock portfolio than I would personally advise. So if somebody asks me, uh, say they're age 60 or 65, how much should I have in these proportions? And I say, well, have you met your, realistically, have you met your retirement goals yet? Do you have enough money to retire with? Can you live off of what you have now? If the answer is yes, then I say you should probably only have um, 15 to 30 percent in stocks right now and everything else in bonds because you don't really want to take a risk of a 2000 eight style market meltdown wiping out a third of your portfolio. Um, so I would have the 2025 at a smaller stock proportion than is represented here. But these are competitive funds and their yields look really bad when the portfolio has 70% bonds in it. And in a competitive environment, you're just not going to see that 70% number. Well, you said with like someone who comes to retirement, you'd advise only like 15, 30 percent stocks to like avoid risk. Why would you have any stocks at all when it'd be even more reliable to own? Because it's all, as I say, like a Bayesian guess. It's if you can sort of think of a slider, you would say, well, what's the market going to do? Uh, in the next five years, and you have this range of possibility from lose 80% of its value to triple in value, but it's not linear, it's bell-shaped or log linear or something, you know, not quite flat. And so you say the more you estimate, the more you risk that the stock market's going to be like a 10% or 20% growth market, the lower the probability of that. So there's never a case where you say, I'm absolutely certain the market's going to turn down or I'm absolutely certain it's going to continue. So if you're feeling this is a weak market and I really think you should avoid it if you are risk adverse, that doesn't mean you sell every stock you have because it looked risk adverse also in the year 2016 right? And look what has happened since then. It's increased in value 50% since then. So someone that as a precautionary move would have gone to all bonds in 2016 would have really lost out. But if you were 30%, I mean, yeah, if you were 30% stocks in 2016, 17 or so, you still got a fairly decent return in your portfolio, but you were in a risk adverse portfolio nonetheless. That's why it's important for you to watch the stocks this week. This could be a breaking point week for stocks. Or they may stop after one or two days of these significant downturns, as they have many times before in 2018, and just turn around yet again. Nobody knows what they're going to do. So you have to adjust the portfolio for either of those possibilities, but you sort of lean on one side or the other. Now, the numbers are looking so sufficiently bad that I'll be surprised if this market continues to rally um, going on out a few months because... There's not much to support it anymore, but we'll see. So now here's the so I don't disagree with the fund philosophy that's shown here. I think this is a smart move. Advising people to invest more in bonds as they get older is implicit in this strategy. I have no problem at all with the strategy. But these funds have fantastic turnover rates and a lot of churn. And for that reason, I don't like them because I think they therefore face hidden costs in, 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 in addition to the fact that their fees are often high. Although these fees for these two funds here have actually dropped a lot in recent years. They used to be well above 1%, like 1.5%, and now they're back well below 1%, and that's a good sign. But again, these kinds of funds, because of their churn rate, face implicit fees that I've already described that may be lowering the yield on them by as much as 1% or 2% or even more. Uh, because of the churn. And so the, in the 2055 fund stopped publishing its churn rate 
in 2018. They don't publish it anymore. It, it may be in the prospectus. I couldn't find it, but maybe they're somewhere. But their turnover rate was 45%, and that's a lot of churn. And I have seen churns for these kinds of funds in excess of 100%. So there's got to be hidden fees there. Uh, and that's why I don't favor them very much. I don't think they're likely to outperform the S&P 500. And the concept is simple enough for you to apply it yourself directly. You don't need a fund manager to do it for you. If you're young, make it 80-20 um, for stocks, unless we're at a time like now, maybe make it 70-30 or even 60-40. As you get older, then raise the bond proportion and drop the stock proportion every five years. How much time would that take? So their fees are usually quite high, and some of them have loads. And if they're sold to you by someone sitting behind a desk, you can bet they have loads, and the loads are high. 5% or so for the uh, front-end load is typical for these things. They have high churn, which implies high embedded fees. They don't invest in stocks directly. They sometimes invest in mutual funds and other financial assets, including ETP. So quite a number of these just buy their own mutual fund family. So it's a mutual fund that buys mutual funds. Uh, so maybe that would have a tendency to lower the fee structure a little bit because that's true. Now, of course, 401ks will be your introduction to mutual funds. And again, I remind you to look at that assigned reading. The video that's posted there tells you what to emphasize from that reading for the exam. So do the reading first, just read it, and then listen to the video. And the video says, here's what I want you to get as a takeaway from that material. And the rest you don't need to try to remember. And that is represented on the exam. I don't think it's represented on the practice exam, by the way, because I didn't remember to stick it in there. But uh, it is represented on the big exam. So when you, you know, when you go to work, you'll be given the option of investing in a 401k. In many cases, your employer will make part of the contribution and often a matching contribution and occasionally more, which is why no matter what, you want to maximize your contribution to the 401k because of the tremendous tax advantage. Again, on the 401k, as that document points out, any contribution to the 401k or a similar IRA-style investment reduces your taxable income by the amount of that investment and that can have a big impact upon your taxes, then your taxes are deferred until such time as you withdraw from the fund when you're retired, typically. The one exception is a Roth IRA, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. Um, your, your offerings will be, however, limited, and sometimes they're not very good. Employers are better now, I think, than offering a reasonable mix of funds. Although Harvey Mudd, or the Claremont Colleges in general, has what I regard as a real crap mixture of funds that I don't like, that I'm forced to choose between. Uh, for a while, they let me buy SPY directly, and so I said, okay, I'll just put everything in SPY. I'll put like $4 million in SPY, we'll just live with that. And then they eliminated SPY, and they said, no, you have to invest in SDY, which is the dividend-paying portion of the S&P 500, because that's, quote, safer. It's like a stupid argument, right? There's no difference between the safety of SDY and SPY. So I raised a bunch of fuss, and it didn't do any good. Um, the fees can be high for these funds because the employers don't do a very good job of getting these down. In fact, this was so much of a problem that it was really scandalous up until the last recession because they would have these sweetheart arrangements between the funds and the employers or the reps in uh, human resources where we'd go to lunch, get drunk, go to Hawaii, you know, go to Vegas, have a good time in Vegas. <laughs> And the fund managers would sell funds <laughs> to the company that had astronomical high fees <laughs> and weren't very good for the employers, but the human resources personnel lived high on the um, implicit bribery. Well, that's been largely eliminated because it was so scandalous on such a large scale in the mid-2000s. Now, the one takeaway that I have that I want to remind you of over and over again, because it will be an issue for nearly every one of you, uh, is that when you transfer jobs and you have, say, $30,000 or so tied up in a crappy 401k that you really can't manage and doesn't have a good fund selection, you have the right to pull every penny out of that and put it into an IRA. And the process is called a rollover IRA. 
there's no such thing, uh, no such object as a rollover IRA. The, the, the reference means you are rolling over into a traditional IRA. And with that, of course, you can invest it in absolutely anything that qualifies for an IRA. And that's just about everything. Stocks, options. Um, my big option trading account you see in my office is an IRA account. And the money that funds that came out of my 403B, um, not because I changed jobs, but because there's some discretionary amounts you're allowed to transfer also that this lecture doesn't cover. But you have the right to transfer 100% of it, and your employer must comply with your request. So many of you will have four or five jobs before you retire. So your choice is to have those scattered all around the world in various uh, crummy IRA 401k accounts or to have them all consolidated into a single IRA that you manage. There is a time limit on this. It's a pretty long time limit. There's a time limit not on initiating the rollover, but there is a time limit on taking it out and then depositing in the new account. So what you normally do is you go to the new account and you say, I'm transferring funds out of this um, investment here and they'll take care of it for you to make sure that it's done in adequate time. Doing this as you change jobs can save you thousands of dollars or more of course. Now when you buy mutual funds as we say here it's not like buying stocks at all. Uh, you can and should buy online directly from a mutual fund family like Vanguard although these days you can buy these mutual funds through a brokerage account and the larger online brokerage accounts don't charge fees for doing it. So you can pick up these Vanguard funds and whatever from Charles Schwab, from um, E-Trade and the like, and not have to pay a fee for it. In some cases, it's not true of all brokers. As a footnote, by the way, I just read, I missed it when the news came out, that um, a month ago or so, interactive brokers have announced they're going to a zero-fee account like Robinhood with small sign up zero fee to compete with Robinhood. So if you're one of those that says, hey, I need a little $500 stock account with no stock trading fees, Interactive Brokers is now making that available to you. And it would be a scale of magnitude above Robinhood in terms of quality, I would think. It's called Interactive Brokers Lite, so you can check it out on your own. Anyway, back to this. Uh, you get mutual fund shares, and so when you look at your mutual fund account online, it's very easy to read. It looks like a bank account. Uh, you don't buy a set number of shares typically. You buy a dollar amount instead. And so you say, I want to buy $5,000 worth of this mutual fund, or I want to contribute $5,000 to the fund, rather than say, I want to buy 100 shares. And um, when you fill it out, it's by the dollar amount typically. And you place your order, of course, anytime during the day, but your order is executed at the end of the trading day after the stock market has been closed. And at that time, the fund determines the net asset value of its holdings and then determines the pre-share net asset value of the mutual fund. And you are sold your shares based upon that NAV. And the number of shares you get which will be some integer value with as many as four decimal places, like 106.3849 shares, will equal the, as you buy them, the dollar value of the investment divided by the NAV, which represents the closing values of all stocks in the mutual fund at the end of the day. And so there's not a daily or moment by moment price. You can't jump in and take advantage of a price you get the NAV at the end of the day. The importance of this NAV, of course, is such that it's critical that the markets actually get really high integrity closes at the end of the day. And that turns out to be a very difficult technical challenge. And it's interesting reading the articles about how they try to comply with that requirement so that the NAVs are fair. It's an odd thing about the way the markets have to close on their end of the day auctions. It's material is too complicated for this class, but um, the fact that you're buying an end of day NAV or the price is what you need to know and remember. There are often restrictions on selling the funds back. 
you may be required to hold the fund for as long as three months before you can sell your shares without penalty. And that, of course, is for the purpose of preventing speculation in the fund. But normally you wouldn't want to sell it if you just invested in it, given that these are long-term investments, long only, and for retirement. Not necessarily retirement only, but certainly that's a big objective. Now, let's take a look at some portfolios. We started this section by saying... It's useful to think of holding your financial assets in the form of a portfolio. It's useful to think of banks managing their assets as portfolios. By definition, mutual funds are portfolios of their portfolio of stocks that make it up. And so I'm giving you a sense of what some conservative, aggressive, etc. portfolios would look at at the present time. Now, there's no set rule on this. It's just set up an example that's kind of typical. And other mixes would be other good examples of conservative. But this is stuff I show people, for example, when they're setting up their own portfolio. And I say, well, you kind of have to decide how risk adverse you are, where you are in your life, what your investment goals are, and how close you are to retirement. The closer you are to retirement, the more conservative you can be, but as young as you are, you can plow through a couple of market downturns, so you probably want to be very heavily invested in stocks, although maybe not right now. Um, this, I mean, this is kind of a bad time. To, I mean, we've seen the numbers, right? The shoulder cape and all that stuff is pretty peaked out right now, and the news is indeed progressively bad. The... Um, I told you in the class that last month's manufacturing index numbers were below 50, and that's a recessionary sign. Now, today they were released, and it was 47.8 or something like that. That's a huge plunge for one month in that statistic. That means that manufacturing has the brakes on, and the largest category of decline in manufacturing is, as you might guess, manufacturing for export. And so the trade war, as it continues on, is hurting businesses that are engaged in manufacturing on both sides of the Atlantic, or at least the part of the trade war concerning itself with China and the United States. Anyway, so it's a, maybe not a good time. Maybe it's a good time to have a conservative portfolio. So if you were to build one, um, then you might say, well, let's put 25% of this on the S&P 500 mutual fund, Okay. And then, but let's have some small cap. Uh, it should say maybe not now, 2016. That should say 2019, actually. Small cap doesn't tend to perform as well at times like this. But uh, normally you'd say, you know, I don't want all my stock investments in the top 500 companies. I'd like to have some small companies represented here. And so if you combine the S&P 500 with the Russell 2000, you'll get that. Then we have U.S. Treasury long, U.S. Treasury short maturities. We'll talk more about what that means, but those are Treasury bonds we're looking at. And then, of course, money market mutual fund is a cash buffer you typically have in your account because as you sell out one class of asset for another, you don't necessarily transfer the money over right away. You may have some reason to sell out stocks, put it in money market funds for a while, and then take it out of money market funds eventually and put it into bonds. So the money market little sliver can get quite large if it's being used as a buffer. And that appears to be the case for many portfolios today because on the data we looked at last um, lecture, mutual fund, money market mutual fund portfolios were quite large uh, compared to their historical levels. Well, this is a simple elementary conservative example where you have about half of the portfolio represented in yield-bearing, safer assets like bonds. So basic strategy, very conservative. Uh, this is a 60-40 mix, which sometimes they say, if you don't know what to do and you're risk adverse and times are normal, uh, go 60-40. 60% stocks, 40% bonds. This is still a very conservative strategy because it has such a large bond representation. So if the market plunges, you'll still have almost 50% of your portfolio doing okay in the face of that. Bonds actually often rise in value as stocks plunge, so the bond portfolio would be growing in value as the stock plunge. Not enough to offset the, entirely the, the plunge in stocks. So 20% S&P 500, 
20% of Russell, 2,000. Maybe uh, some value, growth, and income fund mix, 5% each. Uh, U.S. Treasury long maturity, U.S. Treasury short maturity, and money market. Why we're splitting, by the way, between long and short maturity becomes evident when we take a look at the theory behind bonds, which is about three weeks away. Um, you don't want to be just long or just short, typically. And so that's, a, again, a fairly conservative 60-40 portfolio. Or you may be the kind of person who likes to invest in index and sector funds. Like I said, there have been times when I've loaded up on index and sector, or, yeah, index and sector funds because I felt that the sector in question was going to do very, very well. Like, as I said, oil and oil services as a single sector, gold and gold mining companies as a single sector. The example I gave was in 2003. So if you manage a fund portfolio from this perspective, which you obviously can do if you want, here we have the S&P 500 in 15%. But you'll notice the index funds are always a big part of these portfolios, no matter what the hell you're doing, right? In every portfolio I show you, the index funds play a prominent role. The Russell 2000 takes up 15%, so you have small cap and big cap equally weighted. Then you have pharmaceuticals, oil, technology, precious metals, retail. Not now. <laughs> retail should be zero. So if you got retail, if you chose retail on your portfolio, you're going to lose a lot. <laughs> retail is doing terribly right now uh, because of the structural shift in retail, of course, maybe with the exception of Amazon, which is destroying everything else. Then once again, we have the U.S. long maturity, U.S. short maturity and money market. So uh, this is a fairly, this is a little bit more aggressive strategy because you're counting on these sector funds or technology funds or uh, and the like to do better. They have higher fees associated with them, so you have to overcome that. They're managed funds, so you have to overcome that. But it may very well be that you're right about one or two sectors that you identify as actually outperforming the economy. And if you're into this stuff and study it enough, this may be a choice you would make. Mutual fund is mixed international and bonds. Now, by the way, I'm not going to ask you to remember or memorize the composition of all of this. I am making a generalization about why and how you would change a portfolio. The only thing that I really want you to remember for purposes of the exam is the importance of the mix between stocks and bonds. That, of course, I can ask you a lot about. I've explained it ad nauseum. You've seen a number of examples about it. This is meant for reference when you think, well, how do I want to do this? And let's go back and look at this slide and see what kinds of uh, funds we can invest in, what kind of portfolios we can build, because this would be impossible for you to remember. Uh, again, this is a very mixed international. So here we have international mature stock. Uh, as a big piece, international emerging stock is a big piece. Again, real estate as a big piece. That would do very badly right now, probably, and money market. So international investors or uh, people who travel who have a sense of uh, global investing might say, you know, I think we need to be very well represented in Asia. So we'll have mutual funds that represent Asian companies like Samsung and, and, the, and Fanuc and the like, or Europe, uh, therefore mutual funds that represent them. Remember, to some extent, these funds do well or poorly because of exchange rate issues, and so that feeds into them and makes a difference. I myself stay away from international investments. I think they're too volatile and nearly impossible to understand. They're unpredictable because we never know enough about those economies and those markets to understand as well as you need to to invest in this. So I stay away from the, especially the emerging market. That stuff can just turn bad overnight and, and you don't realize it until after you've lost about 25% of your portfolio. Now these are reasonable risk, reasonable risk thresholds for passive investments. And this is the type of investment where you don't pay a lot of attention to the market. You don't monitor it every day like I do. You don't monitor it very often more than maybe once a month or so. But you can still change the composition of your portfolio as your sense of risk changes with very little time and effort put into it, for example. So 80, 20, 70, 30, and all of that refers to stocks over bonds. So if you're you, 
and you're a young risk taker and the markets are a little stronger maybe than they are right now, but you may disagree. You may say, this is just a hiccup. We've seen 20 of these since uh, 2007, the end of 2017, not 20. We've seen six or seven of these, big downturn, and then it stops and goes right back up and recovers. Maybe this is yet just another of those, in which case 80-20 means that you would buy now because it's been going down substantially for two days and be happy with that. 80-20 80-20 means as a young risk taker, you can write it out anyway. You saw that even if you were invested in 1999, you'd lose a lot, but don't touch it, don't move, don't sell it. And by 2003, it was all fully recovered. And then again, it goes down in 2007, 2008, don't sell it, don't sell it. By 2011 or 12, it's recovered. And since then, it's done a lot better than that. So if you're young like you are, you could be risk adverse in an 80-20 and a 70-30, especially purchased during normal times makes perfect sense. 60-40 is what I say, a neutral portfolio. If you're scared about the stock market, you don't want to read about these 500 and 600,000 point downturns. You want to have a very balanced and safe portfolio. 60-40 is just fine. And you could build a very decent retirement account on that because you know, bonds over the long run actually have reasonably decent yields. And you just leave it at 60-40 until you die. Then give uh, 40% to the church and 60% to your kids and go to heaven. 50-50 if you're already funded and you're above age 60, for example. And then the bottom category is me, 30-70. I'm not even 30-70. I'm about 20-80 right now. A very low... um, very risk adverse, have already made all the money you're going to need to retire, so why put it at risk on a a bad political event that can send the market absolutely reeling? You know, you read about the Ricardian event, right? Nobody could get out of that if they were in it because it happened, and they shut the market down for six days. Global markets just fell, fell, fell through all six days, so when the market opened back up, it was so far down, there was no way to recover. You just had to take the 30% loss. I don't want to do that at age 72, so it won't happen to me. Now, to achieve these in the long run, you have to do portfolio rebalancing, though. And that simply means that if you're trying to do a 60-40 portfolio, for example, then that proportion will change over time, obviously, because part of this will do better than the other part. Usually the stocks will do better than the bonds during normal times, So your 60-40 portfolio gradually becomes a 70-30 portfolio, even if you're still contributing in 60-40 proportions. And then your 70-30 portfolio has the potential to become like an 80-20 portfolio. This would have happened, for example, in uh, 2013 to 2017, or the end of 2017, because the stock market was just roaring as interest rates were coming down on bonds. So to get it back to something that is risk adverse and effectively lock in the capital gains that you've made, then you rebalance the portfolio back to your target. So if the original target was 60-40 and it goes to 70-30, slowly rebalance it back to the um, 60-40 by selling off stocks, locking in the capital gains, and using the proceeds to buy bonds. And so this example is one where you can do it over a two-year period or a three-year period. Obviously, you decide how you want to do it. In some cases, you can do it by changing your contribution to the portfolio. If you're heavy on stocks, then you change your contribution to 50-50 stocks and bonds, and gradually the bond side will climb back up. So you have to decide whether you want to rebalance. Most of you should want to rebalance because in the long run, the market is cyclical. And if you're good at this kind of thing, you can take profits out of the stock market and then let it go down. You do not have to pick the turning points to do this. The methods you use for these are typically methods that involve a large number of discrete small transactions. You don't say one day, hey, we're 70-30, let me take 10% of my entire stock portfolio today and sell it and make it into bonds. Instead, you take uh, you know one quarter of 1% every two weeks or three weeks or so and move it slowly over 
until after a period of one or two years you rebalance back to where you want to be. And that way you don't have to pick the cycle, you just probably be re rebalancing through whatever the cycle is if you're doing it that way. Okay, so that is formally the end of the lectures that you're responsible for. Let me check and make sure that's true. Um, this is The rest of this is, yeah, it is. So I'll say a few things here that some of you will be interested in, but none of this is on the exam. So that's the material capped off that's covered by the last exam. Now, by the way, uh, some of you are interested in ultimately the mathematics of this. And so one of the first applications one would make in trying to grab the mathematical nature of these models is on the diversification question and building models that show the actual diversification effects of a portfolio. And in the modeling, you can demonstrate actually that you can lower substantially the risk of a portfolio without affecting its yield, which of course is very desirable. And in rare occasions, if the markets are inefficient, and they sometimes are, you can actually lower the risk of your portfolio while raising its yield. And, of course, you do that by diversifying in general, but by diversifying any particular way that is guided by models. Now, in case uh, you're curious about how this is approached, this is an example of a starting model that we use in Econ 136, which is a two-asset portfolio variance model. And you can see there that you're using covariances, uh, correlations and standard deviations to evaluate the risk associated with your portfolio. And the standard deviations and covariances, etc., are standard deviations of the log growth rates of these various classes of assets, or in the case of bonds, their rate of return. So it's not of stock prices, it's of log growth rates of stock prices, for example. And so you can demonstrate by using examples, you can have a highly volatile stock that has a higher expected growth rate than a less volatile stock with a respectable growth rate. If you blend them together, you can have a portfolio that has a return almost as high as the highest stock, but you cut your risk measurably nearly in half through that diversification if they are statistically independent. So part of the fun in doing this is to evaluate the statistical independence or the lack thereof through the covariances of these components of your portfolio. Uh, here's an example you can read. I won't read it to you. You've got uh, two uncorrelated stocks. It has a mean return of uh, 2% and um, a variance of 3 and a 4 versus 5. And so calculating the risk, you plug it into the previous formula and you demonstrate that you can get a fairly high rate of return um, with a variance that is lower than the variance of either of the components. And so the math tends to look like that. We use that as a basis to talk about it, then we run into the stuff that really matters, which are these big covariance matrices, and this is where it gets fun. Uh, because it it allows you to test the computational power of your computers that you're using because these are computation intensive, right? So here you go in and you get these big covariance matrices and you evaluate the same type of calculation. And of course, the number of calculations that your machines have to make to do this well rises very, very quickly. And it's a fun way to um, test your programming for memory leaks and for uh, speed and for elegant design, especially if you're using Python. Python's inherently a slow language and is directly useless for this, but if you use NumPy, which is uh, one of the Python libraries that is actually coded in C but accepts Python commands through wrappers, basically, then you are doing this at the speed of C or just barely slower than the speed of C. So it's kind of fun to uh, set this up and make it work. It's also quite a challenge uh, to do. It's not easy to do. So this is where you get started. And if you're curious about, well, is anything that I ever learn uh, useful in finance? Well, of course, these all the stuff I'm telling you about is modeled 
to the nth degree, of course, and this is an example of a fairly elementary application of that. So I can talk about risk appealing to your common sense, which is what I'm doing in this lecture. Of course, the S&P 500 index fund is less risky than buying a single stock in the S&P 500, but I could also demonstrate it mathematically if we had the time and the tools and the database to be able to do it, and that might be more convincing to you. So that's an appeal if you're interested in the modeling to at some point take a look at the modeling, all right? You're not accountable for that, as it says at the top. Don't worry, be happy. In this class, this is not a class that has a math component to it, but this is the reminder that this leads into it. So I don't think I have any more to say. I wanted to make sure I had time to complete this and say everything I need to say about the exam and prep for the exam, but I've done that. So the, you'll be seeing an email about the trial exam. Take that after you're kind of half prepared, I would say it'll do you more good to take it when you think you know the answers to the questions than the second you see it. I am asking you, by the way, do not take it twice, please. Uh, the way I have it set up now, you can do it if you kind of cheat a little bit, take it twice. If the way I, the high secure way, you can't do that. The reason I say that, though, is I pay for these exams. I pay for them out of my pocket. I pay about $1,000 a year to uh, use this software, to experiment with you taking it, and the MUD doesn't reimburse me for it. And in a class like this, if a bunch of you take it twice, you go over the limit, I have to buy the next block up. And that would literally cost me three or four hundred dollars. So I'm asking you, please, just take the exam once. Don't use a fake name and go back and take it a second time. And uh, try to get as much as you can out of it, all right? So then I guess the next time I actually see you, if you don't pop in the office, I'll be there, of course, um, Thursday and Friday, is on exam day itself. So just show up here, of course, with your laptops, but you'll get all this instruction and emails, videos, and everything to make sure you're properly prepared. So we'll see you then.